I always thought I had a normal life, a bit secluded, maybe, but normal. That's what you think when you grow up, surrounded by the same high walls, the same echoing halls. My name is Valentina Ricci, and I live in a large house near the outskirts of Naples. To anyone peering through our iron gates, it might look like a mansion from a fairy tale. But fairy tales don't tell you about the shadows. My father, Luca Ricci, is a businessman, or so he claims. I've overheard enough hushed phone calls and seen enough strange faces coming in and out of our home to guess that his business isn't the kind you learn about in school. He's a broad-shouldered man with a stern face that rarely smiles, except when he's making a deal or when his pals, who reek of smoke and secrets, pat him on the back and call him Padrino. My mother, Maria, is a beautiful woman, but you can see the sadness etched into her face if you look closely enough. She spends most of her days in the garden or in her painting room, where the smell of oils and turpentine mix with her sighs. One evening, I was coming down the stairs, the sound of my footsteps lost in the vastness of our hall, when I heard them, the sharp snaps of my father's voice. I paused, gripping the ornate railing, listening. You can't back out now, we're too deep in this, he growled in Italian. His words were like ice. You think you can just walk away? Think about your family. I wasn't supposed to hear that. I wasn't supposed to know these things. I rushed back to my room, my heart pounding, trying to convince myself that maybe he was just talking about a regular business deal. But deep down, I knew. Days went by, and the visitors became more frequent. My father would be away for days, coming back at odd hours, his suit smelling of smoke and something else, something metallic, like blood. It was during one of those days when he was away that I found my mother crying in the kitchen. She was sitting at the table, her head in her hands, a cup of untouched coffee in front of her. Mama, I said softly, walking over to her. What's wrong? She looked up, wiping her eyes. It's nothing, Valentina. Just, just adult problems, Tesoro. I sat beside her, taking her hand. Is it about Papa? She sighed, her gaze drifting to the window where the curtains fluttered slightly with the breeze. Your father, he has a lot of responsibilities. Things that, well, you wouldn't understand. But why do you cry? I pushed, needing to understand her sadness. It's hard, Valentina, she replied, squeezing my hand. This life, your father's life, it's not simple. I worry about him, about us. But we could leave, right? If it's so bad, why don't we just go? Her laugh was bitter, nothing like the warm chuckle she shared on my birthdays. And go where? Your father's reach is far, and his, colleagues, they don't let people just walk away. I wanted to argue, to scream that we could try, but the resignation in her eyes stopped me. It was then I realized that our gilded cage was locked from the outside, and my father held the key. Life took a turn, and the days blended into a silent monotony. My father decided that school wasn't safe for me anymore. Too many risks, he muttered one evening, not really talking to me, but more to himself. I didn't argue, arguing with Luca Ricci was like yelling at a storm to stop raining. Useless and potentially dangerous. Instead of school, the dining room became my classroom, and a series of tutors came and went. They taught me languages, English, French, even some German. For your future, my father said, but he never explained further. Languages I could handle, but the good manners lessons felt like a joke. Sit up straight, Valentina. A lady never rests her elbows on the table, Valentina. Smile, but not too widely, speak, but not too loudly. One day, I couldn't take another moment of the etiquette tutor's nagging. Why does it matter? I snapped, slamming my book shut. Who am I trying to impress in here? She looked taken aback, her eyes wide and her mouth pinched tight. Your father insists. I don't care what he insists on. I shouted, then immediately regretted my outburst. She was just doing her job, after all. That night, I couldn't sleep. The house felt smaller, tighter. I slipped out of my bed and wandered down to the kitchen for a glass of water. 
The light was on, and my mother was there, sitting at the table again, looking lost in thought. Can't sleep? I asked, my voice a whisper in the large, empty kitchen. She jumped a little, then forced a smile. Just some things on my mind, Valentina. What about you? I shrugged, pouring myself a glass of water. Just tired of all this. I gestured vaguely around. All these rules and lessons. She sighed and patted the chair next to her. I sat down, feeling suddenly very young and very tired. It's for your own good, they say, she murmured, staring at her own untouched tea. But sometimes, I wonder if we're not just preparing you for another kind of prison. I didn't ask what she meant. It seemed too deep, too dark for the night to hold. The next morning, I was supposed to have another language session, but I lingered over breakfast, dreading the return to the dining table turned classroom. Why do I need to learn all this? I asked the guard who watched over the house, and sometimes over me, as if he might have an answer. He just shrugged, his face unreadable. Orders from your father, that's all I know. And there it was again, the weight of silence, pressing down on me, suffocating and impenetrable. As I walked back to the table, the guard's steps echoed behind me, a reminder that even my complaints were monitored, evaluated, and contained within these walls. Days passed, and I grew more resentful, more suffocated by the silence and the secrets. I knew the tutors whispered about me, about my family. I saw the way they looked at me, like I was a bomb that might go off at any mention of the outside world. The days dragged on, each one, blending into the next, with the same dreary sameness. I was turning 18 soon, and I could feel the walls of my home closing in on me. Something had to change, or I would suffocate in this golden prison. On the morning of my birthday, my father called me into his study, a room filled with dark wood and darker secrets. Valentina, he began, his voice firm, you are now of age. It's time we discussed your future more seriously. I tensed, knowing that whatever he had planned wasn't going to be something I'd like. What about my future? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He looked at me, his gaze calculating. You will marry Giancarlo Rossi. He's a good man, comes from a strong family. This will be good for us, for our families. I felt my stomach drop. Marry? But I don't even know him. The thought of marrying a stranger, especially one chosen by my father, made me want to run screaming from the room. It's not a request, Valentina, he said, his voice hardening. It's decided. You will meet him next week. Be ready. After I left his study, my mind raced with panic and fear. Mary John Carlo? I couldn't. I wouldn't. I had to get out of here. Over the next few days, I hatched a plan. It was risky, but it was the only shot I had. I approached my father under the guise of acceptance. Father, I said, trying to sound as meek as I could. Since I am to be married soon, could I perhaps travel to the USA? A kind of, pre-wedding trip? He regarded me suspiciously. Why the USA? I want to see the world a little before I settle down, I lied smoothly. Just a few weeks. I'll be careful. I promise. He pondered for a moment, then nodded. Fine. But Marco will go with you. No arguments. Marco was one of his most trusted guards. The man was a mountain, silent and immovable. The challenge just got bigger, but I had no choice. Thank you, father, I said, keeping my relief hidden. The following week, as planned, I landed in New York City with Marco shadowing my every move. The city was a breath of fresh air, a stark contrast to the stifling life back home. I knew I had to act fast. One day, while Marco was distracted, I slipped into a store and bought a few essentials, clothes, a wig, and a prepaid phone. Later, at a crowded supermarket, I seized my moment. I feigned interest in some products on a lower shelf, waited for Marco to move ahead, then quickly changed my appearance in the restroom. Heart pounding, I walked right out of the supermarket, another face in the crowd. I didn't stop walking until my legs burned and my breath came in sharp gasps. The first few weeks in New York were a blur. 
Every day was a battle between the thrill of freedom and the gnawing fear of being caught. I kept looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see Marco or someone else from my father's world. But the city was big, noisy, and indifferent, a perfect place to hide. Renting a tiny apartment in a less fashionable part of town was my first step towards a normal life. The building was old and the elevator barely worked, but it was mine. My landlord, a grumpy old man named Mr. Klein, didn't ask many questions. Just pay your rent on time, he grunted when handing over the keys. Finding a job was harder. My tourist visa was about to expire, and I knew I couldn't work legally. After many days of searching, I found a small cafe willing to pay cash under the table. It wasn't much, but it was enough to get by. The cafe was run by a tough, no-nonsense woman named Gina. On my first day, she eyed me skeptically. You ever worked a coffee machine before, honey? I shook my head. No, but I'm a quick learner. You better be. I can't afford to babysit, she said, but her tone softened slightly. All right, I'll show you but keep up. Working at the cafe was exhausting, but fulfilling. I learned to make coffee the way New Yorkers liked it, strong and fast. The regulars were a mixed bunch, and slowly, I started feeling less like an outsider. One evening, as I was closing up, a customer I recognized as a regular, Mike, lingered at the counter. You're not from around here, are you? He asked, his tone friendly, but curious. No, I'm not, I admitted, wiping down the counter. You got a story, huh? He pressed, in a way that wasn't prying, but seemed genuinely interested. Doesn't everyone? I replied, offering a smile that didn't reach my eyes. Mike laughed, a deep, hearty sound. True enough. Well, if you ever need help, or a friend, I'm around. Us New Yorkers gotta stick together. His kindness was unexpected and warmed a corner of my heart. Thanks, Mike. I might take you up on that. As days turned into weeks, I grew more comfortable in my new skin. But with my visa expired, I was officially an illegal immigrant. The fear of deportation loomed large, a constant shadow over my newfound independence. As time passed, Mike became more than just a friendly face at the cafe. We started seeing each other outside of my shifts, and I found comfort in his easygoing nature and his willingness to listen. One night, over a quiet dinner, I finally spilled my whole story to him, the fear, the flight, everything. Mike listened, his face a mask of concern. When I finished, there was a long pause. Then he reached across the table, took my hand, and squeezed it. Let's get you sorted, he said. Marry me. I'll help you stay. It wasn't a declaration of undying love, but it was genuine and it was real, more real than anything I'd hoped for. We got married quietly and moved into his apartment. With my new legal status, I managed to land a job as a saleswoman in an upscale clothing store. My language skills and good manners made me a perfect fit, and for the first time, I felt like I was building something for myself. I was still cautious, still looking over my shoulder, but now I had someone by my side. Someone who knew all of me and stayed. Mike and I settled into a semblance of domesticity, and for a moment, I dared to feel safe, even content. I started social media pages to share snippets of my new, seemingly idyllic life. But that veneer of happiness was thin, easily shattered. One evening, scrolling through social media, my newfound peace crumbled. On Mike's page, there was a photo that caught my eye, a picture of him with another woman, her arms wrapped around him, both smiling broadly at some glittery event. Confusion and a sharp sting of betrayal cut through me. I waited, tense and cold, for him to come home. When he walked through the door, I confronted him immediately, holding up my phone to show him the picture. Who is she? My voice was sharp, a knife edge of hurt underlying the question. He looked at the photo and then back at me, his expression unreadable for a moment. Then he sighed, a sound of resignation. That's Lisa, he admitted. I've been seeing her. The simplicity of his confession, the blunt honesty of it, knocked the wind out of me. Seeing her? While you're married to me? I struggled to keep my voice even. Valentina, 
I thought you understood, he started, his tone frustratingly calm. Our marriage, it was more of a, convenience, a help. It wasn't meant to be real. Real. The word echoed mockingly around the sparse living room. I felt a bitter laugh bubble up. Not real? You think because you married me to help me out that it gives you the right to, what? Cheat openly? Where does that leave me, Mike? He shrugged, a gesture that ignited my anger further. I told you, I don't see this as a real marriage. I thought we had an understanding. An understanding? No, Mike, you never said you'd humiliate me like this. The hurt was rapidly being replaced by a searing anger. He looked at me hard then. Valentina, you can always go back to your father if something doesn't suit you. As the days turned into weeks, Mike's behavior worsened. He began to drink more, his temper shortening with each glass. He started ordering me around, his words sharp and commanding. If I protested, he'd remind me of my precarious situation, of the ease with which he could send me back to my father. You should be grateful. He'd sneer. I'm your ticket to staying here, remember? His nights out became more frequent, and I was left alone, wrestling with my thoughts, the loneliness eating at me. Then, one evening, he went too far. Coming home drunk, he threw a demand over his shoulder as he stumbled past me. Go sleep on the balcony tonight. I don't want to hear you moving around and bothering me. Then, one morning, as if my life needed more complication, I received a message from my father on social media. The message was cold, threatening. I know where you are. You will come home, or you will suffer the consequences. You have shamed us, running away like a coward. You will be locked away if you force my hand. I showed the message to Mike, hoping, perhaps foolishly, for some semblance of support or protection. Instead, his eyes lit up with a grotesque kind of glee. This is perfect, he said, grinning. We can use this. The idea was out of some wild crime drama, but Mike was buzzing with excitement about it. We're gonna stage your kidnapping. It's foolproof. We demand a ransom from your old man, he pays, and we're set. He explained with a grin that didn't reach his eyes. I stared at him in disbelief. You can't be serious. This is insane, I protested, the weight of the plan sinking in. We can't just pretend I'm kidnapped. What about the consequences? Mike waved off my concerns with a flick of his hand. Consequences? Val, look, your father won't ever find out it was us. We'll be long gone with the cash before anything can backfire. I tried again, my voice firm. I don't want to do this, Mike. It's wrong, and it's dangerous. But Mike wasn't listening. His mind was made up. It's too late for cold feet, he snapped. He grabbed my phone and locked himself in the bedroom, leaving me pacing the living room, feeling trapped and helpless. Hours later, he emerged with a smug look. Done, he said, showing me the message he'd sent to my father. It claimed that I had been kidnapped, and the ransom was a million dollars. He even managed to take a convincing photo of me, looking distressed and weary, which he attached to the message. Mike was practically bouncing on his heels as he replied, Now we wait. Once he pays, we can finally get the hell out of here. The waiting was the hardest part. I felt like I was in a bad dream, watching the hours tick by, each minute stretching out endlessly. Mike was glued to his computer, checking the offshore account repeatedly, while I tried to stay out of his way, my anxiety mounting. Then, just a day later, Mike hooped with joy. He paid. The money's here. His delight was grotesque, as he logged into the account and showed me the balance. A million dollars. It was real. This was actually happening. I'm heading to the bank first thing to get this sorted into cash. We'll need to move fast after that he said, already grabbing his coat and keys. As the door slammed behind him, I realized that Mike, in his own way, was no different from my father. Here I was, caught between the criminal machinations of my father and the deceitful schemes of my husband. I had escaped one cage only to find myself locked in another. I was throwing my clothes into a bag when I heard Mike's car pull up outside. 
My heart hammered in my chest as I scrambled to destroy anything that might lead him, or worse, my father, to me. Shredding papers, deleting emails, I was a whirlwind of desperate activity. Just as I zipped up my bag, the door flew open. Mike stumbled in, his eyes glazed over from drink, a wild grin plastered on his face. He dangled his car keys in front of him. Hey, Val, go fetch us some dinner from that Chinese place, will ya? I'm starved. His slurred words barely registered as I took the keys, my mind racing. This was my chance. Without a word, I bolted for the door, heart pounding as I slipped into the driver's seat of his car. I didn't head for the restaurant. Instead, I drove. The highway stretched out before me like a ribbon of freedom, and I pushed the car faster, watching the city lights blur past. My pulse matched the frantic beat of the tires on the road. I had no destination in mind, just away, anywhere but here. My phone buzzed incessantly in the passenger seat, a relentless reminder of the world I was fleeing. At a red light, I grabbed it, turned it off, and tossed it into a trash can on a deserted street corner. If my father had ways of tracking me, I wouldn't make it easy for him. Hours passed as I drove, the night deepening around me. By the time I pulled into a motel in a small town I didn't know, my nerves were frayed, and exhaustion was setting in. I checked in under a fake name, paid in cash, and collapsed on the bed. Sleep was fitful, filled with nightmares of chases and captures. When morning broke, I was already awake, staring at the ceiling, trying to piece together my next move. I turned on the TV for background noise more than anything else, but froze when a news report caught my attention. Mysterious attack last night in New York City. The victim, identified as Michael Davidson, was found dead in his home, which appeared to have been ransacked by unknown assailants. The breath whooshed out of me. Mike was dead. The reality hit me like a physical blow. Whatever his faults, whatever the mess he'd dragged me into, I hadn't wished him dead. The report speculated that the attackers were searching for something, possibly related to criminal activities. I packed up in a rush, my hands shaking. I needed to get away before anyone connected me to Mike's death. As I loaded the last of my bags into the trunk of the car, a heavy weight settled at the bottom, caught my eye. It was a gym bag I hadn't noticed before. Curious and wary, I unzipped it. Inside, stacks of cash stared back at me, hundreds, thousands, a million dollars in crisp bills. The ransom money. Mike must have stashed it here before coming inside last night. For a long moment, I just stared. This money was the cause of all this chaos, the reason Mike was dead, the reason my life was in ruins. But it also represented a chance, a chance to start over, to live free from my father's shadow, to compensate for years of fear and manipulation. The nagging fear of my past catching up never completely left me. I made a tough decision, one that went against my morals, but felt necessary for my safety. I underwent plastic surgery and purchased documents in a new name. It was against the law, and the guilt weighed on me, but the fear of my old life, discovering me, was stronger. I reassured myself it was a necessary evil to protect my newfound peace. Finally, I found myself drawn to a small coastal town. I rented a small apartment with a view of the ocean, the soothing sound of the waves a constant reminder of the freedom I now possessed. The first few weeks were tough. I took long walks on the beach, the salty air clearing my mind, helping me to plan. I needed a job, a way to sustain myself without dipping into the gym bag full of cash too often. One morning, while sipping coffee at a local diner, I overheard a conversation from the next table. We're swamped at the gallery, since Jenna left. Can't seem to find anyone who knows their way around handling artwork. Without thinking, I turned and said, I have experience with that. It wasn't entirely true, but I had helped organize charity art auctions back in the city. The woman looked me over, her eyes sharp, but not unkind. Is that so? You looking for work? Yeah, I am, I replied, my voice steadier than I felt. Come by tomorrow. Let's see what you've got, she said, handing me a business card. Her brisk, no-nonsense tone reminded me of Gina, but gentler. 
That conversation turned into a job offer, and suddenly, I found myself working at a local art gallery. It was a small place, but it buzzed with creativity and passion. Months passed, and life found a new rhythm. The fear that had clung to me, shadow-like, began to dissipate. I was no longer looking over my shoulder, no longer jumping at shadows. I started to make friends, real friends who knew nothing of my past, only the person I was now.